Okay, uh, so we can get started. So, uh, Jacopo, uh, please. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome uh, to this colloquium. Uh, it is a pleasure for me uh, to introduce to all of you uh, Bianca Poggianti, who I know since last uh, millennia, because she was my uh, master thesis co-supervisor, and then we also kept working together. Um, so Bianca has a master in physics, uh, gotten at the University of Pisa in Italy, and then a PhD in astrophysics from Padova University. Uh, she went on, uh, the, the thesis was in uh, spectral modeling of, uh, of galaxies. Uh, then she went on with the postdocs in Groningen, in Holland and in Cambridge, uh, UK, and then she got a permanent position at the Padova Observatory in, uh, in Italy, well, uh, where actually I, I met her. Um, Bianca is now a full professor in the same place in Padova at uh, the National Observatory, and uh, she's very active. Uh, she's one of the experts in galaxy evolution uh, with a particular focus on uh, galaxy in clusters. Uh, she is one of these people who's uh, invited uh, as a uh, invited speaker in, in congresses about the galaxy evolution. She received a Bessel Award from the AMBO Foundation in 2006, if I'm correct. And she's the PI of several surveys, among which WINGS, uh, E-DISCs, and the most recent one, GASP, that got recently awarded an ERC uh, for uh, 2000, uh, for 2.5 million, sorry. So that's the, the PI. Bianca is the PI of this as well. And now uh, today she will present some results from the GASP survey. So, word to you, Bianca. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Uh, I guess you see my whole screen and now you should see my, my slides. Yeah? Y yes. Okay, well. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure. I thought it would have been nicer to be there in person, of course. Um, I was looking at your webpage and I was trying to see what, uh, what the people uh, at your institute are working on. And so I was looking a little bit at the interests. So I saw that you have a lot of uh, radio astronomy, interstellar medium, star formation, of course, stellar populations. I've been knowing Jacopo and Gustavo for ages, forever, all my life, since I was very, very young. And so I decided to um, select uh, these topics that you see in the title for today's seminar um, from the survey that uh, Jacopo mentioned that I've been working on in the last, we have been working on in the last, uh, in the last few years. So I will talk about uh, star formation, uh, multi-phase gas, and a little bit on also AGN activity in these uh, um, so-called jellyfish galaxies, which I will define in a, in a second. So but first, let me uh, mention what the uh, project is. So uh, GASP is the acronym for gas stripping phenomena in galaxies. And it started as an ESO large program with the MUSE integral field spectrograph. So it's integral field spectroscopy, optical integral field spectroscopy of 114 galaxies at low redshift. Um, the goal of this survey from the beginning was to study uh, how gas is affected in galaxies, especially from environmental effects. So where, how and why the gas can be removed from a galaxy disk and what are the consequences for the galaxy star formation rate and star formation histories. So these galaxies are um, in different environmental conditions. The majority are in galaxy clusters, but we also have a, a third of the sample, which is in galaxy groups, filaments, and isolated. And um, this uh, collaboration then obtained uh, a, a number of follow-up programs for different wavelengths with ALMA, APEX, JVLA, MIRCAT, now ATCA, UVIT, HST, shooter. So uh, in a way that we could study not only the stars 
and the ionized gas with the integral field spectroscopy, but also other gas phases like the molecular gas, the H1 gas, and so on and so forth. And this is what I'm going to, to show today. And of course, Jacopo is, and he's always been in all my projects, a collaborator. Um, so these are low, uh, low ratio galaxies, as I said, and they span uh, a range in galaxy masses between 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 11.5. Okay, let me go. Uh, so the, the very general motivation for this work is, uh, um, of course, the fact that galaxies are not closed boxes. They are open boxes. And therefore, uh, in order to understand galaxy evolution, um, it, it has been realized already for decades that it's necessary to understand the gas inflow and outflow processes. So how the gas enters and exits the, the galaxy disks. And because this is what regulates the star formation histories. And today um, I will focus on the galaxy clusters where the main mechanism is run pressure stripping. Run pressure stripping is a, a process, a physical process uh, that are especially uh, efficient uh, in galaxy clusters, but also in galaxy groups. And it's the, the drag force that the intracluster medium uh, exerts on the galaxy interstellar medium. And therefore it's like a wind, this is, these are simulations, it's like a wind blowing through the galaxy and creating these uh, um, one-sided tails of gas. So the gas gets stripped, as we say. So it gets removed from the disk and sometimes gets unbound and it's lost forever. So this is the, the general uh, process and the general framework. Now, the fact that run pressure stripping um, exists uh, observationally has been known for a long time. And the first evidence for the efficiency of run pressure stripping in clusters came from the studies of neutral gas. So H1 studies, like the one, I hope you can see my cursor, I think so. On the top left, um, uh, you see an example of a galaxy in the Virgo cluster, and you see the H1 contours, so the neutral gas contours on top of the optical disk, our band image optical disk. So um, early on, um, there was the first evidence that um, galaxies in clusters are so-called H1 deficient. So they have less neutral gas than similar galaxies in the field. And this was in an indirect, um, uh, indirect evidence for run pressure stripping. But there is also very direct evidence for run pressure stripping, which is we observe directly the gas as it being stripped, where you see what we call the tails. So the, the gas that is extra planar, in this case, uh, it's a small uh, effect. In other cases, you will see it's much more evident. And it's not only in neutral gas, but uh, subsequent studies found, for example, um, tails of ionized gas that you see here. Do you, do you see my full screen now? Yes, you should. Um, you see uh, yes. tails of ionized gas uh, observed with H-alpha narrowband imaging. There are also a few tails observed in X-ray. And in more recent years, there have been the first studies done with uh, integral field spectroscopy, like the one here at the bottom. This was the first news uh, uh, study of, um, of a run pressure strip tail, long tail. And this is the H-alpha emitting gas, the ionized gas that emits in each alpha, and the galaxy is actually down here, and this is a very long uh, 100 kiloparsec day or so. Actually, run pressure stripping, stripping at some level can also be observed from UV and optical images. What I mean by that is these are a few examples. Let me admit the Nelson. Uh, these are a few examples um, where you, you do see uh, some of the gas per galaxies in this case, and you see some extra planar one-sided debris, stellar debris in these cases. This, this is the B-band light. Actually, this is the Mu's uh, white light, but anyway, it, they emit mostly in the blue light. And, um, and we see that 
there are some uh, smaller tails also in the optica. However, everything is much more evident when we look at the ionized gas. So these are the same galaxies. I will flip between these two slides. And you see in white the stars, essentially, and you see in uh, orange here the H-alpha emission. So the stripping is much more evident when you observe the gas, of course, because the stripping only acts on the gas and not on the stars. So uh, what are these, uh, by now, I think uh, the quite famous jellyfish galaxies. It's a term that has been used um, maybe by Smith the first time or maybe Becky even before, a year before. Uh, this is what really means jellyfishes, that they have tails on one side of the disk. And so the images are distorted and they have these uh, filaments and tentacles on, on one side of the disk. Um, of course, not all ram pressure strip galaxies are jellyfish galaxies, but all jellyfish galaxies are ram pressure stripped. In other words, these objects that you see here, you see here an example, three examples, are all due to ram pressure stripping. And again, the white are the stars and the red is the H alpha emission. These are again three examples. So ram pressure. Um, acts in various ways and at various degrees of stripping. So, as I said, not all ram pressure strip galaxies have these very huge ionized gas tails, like the one in the middle. There are others that have smaller tails, maybe at the beginning of the ram pressure stripping process. And then there are some others that have been almost completely stripped of their gas and the ionized gas is only left in the center. So uh, they are what we call truncated disks, H-alpha truncated disks. So the H-alpha is concentrated in the central region where eventually will also be stripped. Okay, so before we go to the uh, main topics that I want to talk about, which is stuff formation gas and, and AGN, uh, let me just um, show you a couple of things of what we can learn from the MUSE data. Uh, of course, integral field spectroscopy is uh, incredibly rich in information and um, uh, you can obtain almost anything you can think of about stars and about the ionized gas, the one that emits in emission lines. Uh, one thing that, of course, you can obtain is the gas and stellar kinematics. So you see here um, two examples. The one at the top is the same galaxy, only on the left you see the gas uh, velocity, so the H-alpha velocity field, this is the gas kinematics, and on the right you see the stellar uh, velocity field. Uh, at the bottom you see another galaxy again, uh, you see the gas very long tail and you see the stars only in the disk essentially. As you can see the stellar component is not disturbed, the stellar kinematics is regular, uh, because ram pressure stripping does not affect the stars, it only affects the gas, okay? And uh, this, this signature is particularly typical of ram pressure stripping that the gas gets stripped and keeps on rotating while it's stripped uh, several kiloparsecs downstream. So you, you still see the rotation even in the tail, as you can see, you can see here. Star formation histories, uh, what, uh, what we do is we derive the full star formation history in different age beans from full spectral fittings, spectrophotometric modeling with the synopsis code of, of Jacobo that I'm sure you, you heard of and you know very well. Uh, and so with this, we, this is another example of a galaxy that is a truncated disk, essentially most of the, of the H alpha in the outskirts um, in the outer regions of the disk have already, has already been stripped, but there is still a little tail. Um, we can so study the stellar components at different ages, a very old component, older than six times 10 to the nine years, intermediate age, recent, let's say between 20 uh, mega years and 600 mega years, and even the ongoing star formation. Although the ongoing star formation we really derive from the H alpha emission more than from the spectral fitting. 
there are many different galaxies. Every galaxy has its own story, but there are common trends that I will partly show. Um, there is still ongoing recent star formation in the tails, uh, while the older stars are only confined in the disk. Okay, and I'll show you in a moment why. So a little bit on the uh, star formation, starting from the uh, global star formation rate, the integrated uh, star formation rate, and then we go uh, spatially resolved. So the, one of the first things that became obvious is that um, Ram pressure strip galaxies, where we still observe the ionized gas, um, have on average a moderate announcement of the star formation rate. So this is a well-known star formation rate mass relation. Uh, this is the standard one for uh, normal galaxies. The round pressure strip galaxies tend to lie above the normal relation. So they have a star formation rate that is slightly announced by 0.2 dec or so. It's not a huge announcement, but it tells essentially that during the first stages of the round pressure stripping, there is the compression of the gas due to the encounter with the intercluster medium. And the galaxies move from the main sequence, they move upwards in star formation before they go down and quench and finally quench. I will show you also the final, the final phases of this process. Um, even more unexpectedly, it has become clear in the last few years that there is also ongoing star formation in the strip tails of gas. Okay, so um, these are the, the only three studies, the only three integral field studies apart from, from gas, and they already, they all found that there was star formation in the ionized uh, gas outside of the disk in the tails. Um, in principle, there can also be other mechanisms that ionize the gas that is stripped. Uh, but it's interesting to find that when we do now a, a study on a large sample of these galaxies, we find that the dominant ionization mechanism of the gas in the tails is photonization by the young massive stars. In other words, it's in situ star formation in the tails. And this is based on the BPT diagrams, so uh, on the diagnostic diagrams of emission lines um, with different uh, ratios. This star formation is happening in clumps, in star forming clumps, which I hope you can appreciate um, here. These are these uh, brighter knots that you see in the tail. These are H alpha bright knots. They are quite cold dynamically, so uh, not a large velocity dispersion, and they must be forming in situ in the tails. The luminosities of these clumps are typical of like giant H2 regions or super giant H2 regions uh, in our galaxy or in, in the LMC or so. So they are bright guys, they're pretty bright. Um, we can also study the stellar content of these clumps in the tails. And um, we find that the stellar masses of these clumps ranges typically between 10 to the uh, 5 to 10 to the 7.5. So the, a typical uh, clump uh, in the tail is about three times 10 to the six solar masses, which is pretty high. Um, it's uh, a stellar mass that corresponds to the to that of ultra compact dwarf galaxies or even you know globular clusters object. So uh, are we witnesses the formation of this type of objects in the tails uh, of stripped gas. Uh, I also want to mention that the global star formation rate that we observe in the tail uh, can vary a lot, can vary between a few percent uh, up to 20 percent of the total star formation rate of the system. So of the whole system, I mean disk and, and tail, everything, the, the whole galaxy. Um, it's quite extraordinary because these stars are formed without an underlying disk. 
outside of the disc, and they form in a gas that is embedded in the intracluster medium. The intracluster medium is hot, it's typically 10 to the 7, you know, Kelvin or so, or even higher. Uh, yet the clamps in the tails seem to follow the standard scaling relations valid for star forming clamps in galactic disks. What I mean by this standard scaling relations, I will show you one in a second, is for example, the relation between uh, the velocity dispersion uh, of the gas and the H alpha luminosity. This is one of the relations. It seems like the star formation proceeds quite normally in these systems. Of course, assuming that the IMF is the normal one. However, the uh, MUSE data has a resolution of about one kiloparsec at this, uh, this ratio. So the true sizes of these clumps were still unknown by these first works until we got some HST data. So HST uh, is coming in. We have three galaxies so far um, and more data uh, is being taken. And I hope you can appreciate on your screen that these are the small clumps I was talking about. These blue smudges that you see here now, also this one. These are uh, clumps or sometimes they're called fireballs because they have this elongated uh, um, structure. And uh, this is the same galaxy with a different uh, contrast just to show the incredibly uh, dusty um, region around the central AGN. Talk about the AGN. From the HSC data, we are able to study the real sizes of these clumps. And, um, and of course, as well as the uh, H alpha luminosity, because we also have H alpha HST from um, H alpha from HST and several, um, several filters. So these are very preliminary results. I'm showing this for the first time. I think Jacopo didn't see this yet. And this is one of the scaling relations I was telling you about. So there is a well-known relation between the luminosity uh, of the clamp and uh, this is the diameter. Uh, of the clump, the effective diameter in this sense. And uh, uh, these objects typically have a few hundred parsec diameter. So we now finally can observe and resolve this, uh, these objects. I saw that some of you work on the magnetic fields. So I, I wanted to show this slide because it has to do with star formation. And, you know, I know nothing, I knew nothing about magnetic fields before this study. So um, bear with me and I, I hope I don't say anything really stupid. But this was um, the, the first um, study of the magnetic field in a jellyfish tail. So, you know, one of these objects. And uh, this is based on, uh, on, uh, data, of course, uh, radio data, and we find that the magnetic field vectors are parallel uh, aligned with the direction of the tail. And this, that is also the stripping direction, in other words. Okay, so there is an incredibly well-ordered magnetic field running through the tail. The spectral index in the tail, the radio spectral index is very steep, and I'm told that this means that these are aged electrons. They are old electrons. So the electrons that were um, injected quite some time ago. And the fractional polarization is extremely high. So there are little turbulent motions. Why do I mention these results uh, now? For two reasons. First, because uh, through a number of, of simulations, a uh, comparison with these observations, we concluded that this is consistent with the fact that there is an accretion of magnetized plasma from the intercluster medium onto the stripped interstellar medium. So in other words, the hot intercluster medium condenses on the external layers of the tail. Okay. And this gives this very ordered magnetic field that we, that we observe. Also, the magnetic field can be a key factor for allowing star formation to happen in these tails. Um, this might be in a sort of self-regulating process and sort of feedback. If the star formation were too high, it would disrupt the ordered magnetic field, but there is the magnetic field which probably allows the star formation to continue. And, and 
this is just one galaxy that has been studied so far. So this is, uh, I'm not claiming this is the case for all street galaxies. Of course, we need more, more examples of this, more data. Okay. Um, now, these tales are fascinating for many reasons, but they're also fascinating because they emit a different wavelengths. And every wavelength is like a window on a physical process, which is very, very interesting. Um, you know, this is an example of one of the few galaxies for which there are there is really a large wavelength coverage. So there is a alpha emission here on the top left. There is UV data from AstroSat, uh, ALMA data, uh, so molecular CO, uh, essentially CO two to one and one to zero um, in, in pink in the middle. There is X-ray Chandra, there, are, there is radio continuum. Now we also have Mirkat data that I don't show here because it was not in this paper. And there are two things I want to mention about, uh, about this, especially about star formation. Um, having different traces of star formation, we had H alpha, we have UV, we have CO. So these different traces, they really trace different phases of the star formation process. And this is something that we can directly observe in the tails. In other words, we see clumps where that are only molecular clumps still. We see clumps where there is molecular H alpha and CO. We see more advanced evolved clumps where the CO is dissolved, there is still H alpha and UV, and we see UV only clumps. And this, this is also a special sequence in some of the tails. So we see star formation that proceeds in, in these tails. Another thing I want to mention is that um, we found for the first time uh, a correlation between the surface brightness of H alpha and the X-ray surface brightness. Okay, this is shown here for the two galaxies we have so far with X-ray, when we are doing more Chandra uh, studies in this case. And you can see that the H alpha surface brightness, focus on the red points, which are the star forming regions. These are star forming uh, regions in the tails, okay. Or in the disk, in some case. Um, there is this clear correlation and this correlation is also in agreement with what I mentioned before about the magnetic field. So the fact that this X-ray emitting plasma probably originates at the interface between the interstellar medium and the intracluster medium. The interstellar medium is somehow heated by the cooling or mixing with the intracluster medium. And therefore uh, this uh, interesting correlation arises. Okay, so they are star forming, they are strongly star forming, they form stars in the tails, but eventually they quench. There's no, no doubt about that. We see the quenching that proceeds outside in. What I mean by outside in, I find my, do you see me or you only see my, my slides? Um, I see your slides, but mostly. Um, okay, then I don't show you what I have in my hand. <laughs> right. No, what I want, uh, what I want to uh, point out is that we see the quenching proceeding outside in. What I mean is that the gas gets stripped first in the outer regions of the galaxy first, and then the, the stripping proceeds towards the center. So the outer regions of the disk are the first ones that stop forming stars, and they have this typical post-star bus signatures, very strong boundary lines in absorptions. Okay, we see this happening even in the still star forming galaxies. We also have a subsample of gas of non-star forming galaxies. They have total post-star bus in all the disk. Throughout the disk, there is no gas left, no ionized gas left at least, and no star formation left. And, uh, and we see them just after they have stopped forming stars throughout the disk. And this is therefore, we see how ramp pressure stripping is a very efficient way to shut off the star formation and quench the galaxy completely um, outside in. Okay. Now, what is the connection between the star formation and the gas? Since the goal here is to study the, the gas, um, events, let's say. Uh, 
first of all, molecular gas, which is the one that is more closely linked to the star formation. Um, from the beginning, from uh, single dish studies, it was understood that these guys contain large amounts of molecular gas, both in the tails and in the disks. Okay, the beam was very large, low spatial resolution, but I mean, we could only measure the, uh, the total amount of, of uh, molecular gas mass. Then ALMA came in and of course, sorry, of course, that's my home phone. ALMA allows to study the individual CO clumps. And you see here two examples. This is not from GASP, but the one on the left. This is the beautiful ISO uh, 137001, uh, where you see the galaxy, you see the H alpha green gas, and you see the CO clumps in the tails all the way up here. Okay. We see the same here. This is the uh, stars in bluish, red, in red, the, the CO2 to 1. And this is the same galaxies where we see the CO in gray and the H alpha emission contours in blue here all around. Okay. So these CO clumps are massive between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar masses. And at least some of this molecular gas must be formed in the tails. It cannot be stripped from the, uh, from the disk all the way down here. You know. What I mean is that probably it's gas that was already denser on average when it got stripped from the disk and then it collapsed and, and the form stars when it's already outside of the disk in the tails. The neutral gas uh, generally where we have H alpha tails, there are also H1 tails. So where there is a tail of ionized gas, there is also a tail of neutral gas. But until now, there are only few, a few galaxies where we have all the multi-wavelength information. And the morphologies of the tails at different gas phases can be very different. I show you here on the left is an example of a galaxy where DH1, which is the blue contours, extends as much as the H alpha, which is the red. Of course, they have different resolution. Here, the, the H1 is much lower resolution. You see the beam here to the bottom right. Okay. But more or less, the stand of the tail is the same. On the right, instead, you see another galaxy where the blue is the neutral gas, so this is the H1, and the brown is the ionized gas. So the H1 in this case extends much more than the ionized. And I can also show you another example of the opposite, vice versa, that the H alpha. Yeah. It's very, very interesting to compare the amount of gas in different phases with the stellar mass of the galaxy and with, the, um, and with each other, let's say. So, there are three results. It's a very busy uh, slide. I apologize for this, but I will guide you through. It's, it's actually three simple concepts. The first one here on top shows you that the mass, the molecular gas mass with respect to the stellar mass of the galaxy is unusually high. It's very high. These are the four jellyfishes we have so far. And these are uh, below, you see the normal galaxies, the gray points and the uh, and, and the lines. Okay, so the ratio molecular gas over galaxy stellar mass is four or five times higher than in normal galaxies. The ratio of molecular gas over neutral gas is shown here, bottom left, and it's also very, very high, between four and a hundred times higher than in the normal galaxies. But the total gas mass, which is bottom right, so the total H1 plus uh, H2 um, gas mass over stellar mass is actually not so unusual for galaxies of that mass. So it looks like, going to the bottom line, these guys uh, have an efficient conversion of neutral gas into molecular gas. 
So they still have, they are at the stage where they still have a lot of gas, but most of this gas has been transformed from neutral into molecular by what process, in, in detail how physically, we don't know yet. So this means that if we look at the H1 mass, so if you look at the neutral uh, gas, these objects have a high star formation efficiency. So for example, these are the two galaxies studied in detail so far. Um, they have a higher star formation rates for their H1 mass than the normal galaxies here. So star formation rate is high, but the CO is even higher. So actually the star formation efficiency in the CO is quite low, okay. Um, this is shown here. I know it's a lot to process, but this is essentially the uh, star formation rate density on the y-axis and uh, molecular gas mass density on the uh, x-axis. And normal galaxies, let's say, are this blue in normal galaxies at the same resolution, especially resolved resolution we have, would be this blue line here. And as you can see, most of the specs, so this is one, just one galaxy, every point is a different location within the galaxy or the tail, this one, the tail. So it's forming stars vigorously, but it's still forming little stars for the amount of CO that there is. Of course, I should say that, mention at least, that there are so many uncertainties in the conversion between the CO we observe and the total mass of molecular gas. But even, you know, we did try everything, sort of. Um, if you see here, these points, they have different, you know, uh, conversion of CO2, H2 mass, and so on. And still, however you do it, this conversion is still a lot of molecular gas. Okay. Um, I don't know what the time is, but do I have last five minutes? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to mention the last uh, thing, um, which is related, not with star formation, but with another source of feedback, uh, which is uh, um, something that was unexpected when we started this study. We surely didn't expect this. Um, and there are four results here. So the first one is, when we had the first small sample, there were only seven galaxies, when we had the first small sample of seven galaxies, jellyfishes, long tails, we found a very high fraction of AGM. So six out of the seven uh, had an AGM. And this is an unusually high fraction, uh, even for the masses that, uh, these are pretty massive galaxies, but it's an unusually high fraction. And so this result suggested that is the run pressure that is somehow triggering the AGN activity. Um, hypothesis is that this happens because the ISM is to so the interstellar medium rotates, but interacts with the intercluster medium that does not rotate. So it loses angular momentum and somehow this uh, favors the inward motion of the of the gas towards the central regions of the galaxy. I realize this is a very hand waving. I mean, this we didn't try any simulations yet. We we are trying now. We are currently running high resolution simulations to understand if this is the case and why. Uh, this high fraction of AGN was found from the MUSE data, so from optical spectroscopy, BPT diagrams, so emission lines. However, there are some galaxies that are edge-on, especially those that are edge-on, like the one that uh, Jacopo studied here, uh, that are very dust obscured because we see through the dust uh, in the disk. But there, the AGN is invisible visible at optical wavelengths, but can be detected in X-ray. So the X-ray information here uh, um, finds, anyway, an obscured AGN. You know, this AGN contain molecular outflows and also ionized outflows, of course. And uh, uh, in some cases, we also have uh, very large ionization cones. 
So we see on a galaxy-wide scale, like 20 kiloparsec of ionization cones from the AGN, where you know the, the lines are typical of, uh, of AGN uh, ionization. Um, in particular, one of these objects that we studied in, in greater detail, uh, we found a very strong effect also of the AGN feedback. So uh, this galaxy is a jellyfish. It has the AGN in the middle, but it also has a hole in the middle in the CO, which is this one, the one on the, um, on the left. There is a hole in the middle in the CO. There is a hole in the UV light which is the middle one here. And this hole is filled with ionized gas that is powered by the AGN, that is the red regions, the red region. This is quite a large region of the disk. It's eight kiloparsec long in this direction. So it looks like um, uh, we see, and we see a sign of an older bubble. We see a sign of the AGN sweeping up the central region of, of the galaxy, while run pressure is sweeping up the outer region of the galaxy. So this galaxy is being quenched from the inside by the AGN and from the outside by run pressure stripping. So this is a party, uh, you know, a quenching party somehow. Uh, I should say, I should mention that this uh, result is based on a few galaxies. Um, there have been other studies, uh, not with integral field spectroscopy, that, but anyway, that did not confirm large fractions of AGNs in run pressure strip galaxies. So we are currently uh, in the process of publishing the whole GASP sample and the whole uh, jellyfish uh, literature sample with AGN. So we will have a much large, larger statistics to conclude if this run pressure AGN connection really exists. Okay. So um, let me summarize. Uh, um, I'm sorry if I showed so many things, but it was already hard to choose. Um, in uh, these so-called jellyfish galaxies and in general galaxies that are undergoing stripping um, are really an excellent opportunity to study a number of physical processes. Uh, they are under, they, they live in extreme environmental conditions. Um, embedded in a very hot plasma, and uh, um, they they are really extraordinarily laboratories to study to study physics at so many levels, including the star formation. Uh, these are clearly objects that entered the clusters as star forming spirals. They are getting quenched by the run pressure stripping, and they will become passive non star forming spirals or as zeros. And we see them in this transformation. And we also have some of the end products of this in the sample, like the post arbors that I showed <clears throat> before. So I focused essentially on three things, on the star formation that is announced in the disks and also happens in the tails, in situ in the tails. Then I focus on the relation between the star formation and the gas uh, at different phases. And uh, in particular, I, I emphasize the, the, the amount of molecular gas and the likely efficient conversion of natural gas into molecular gas in, this, uh, in these tails <clears throat> and also in the disks, actually. And finally, I concluded with uh, um, uh, some evidence of a possible uh, connection between run pressure and AGN activity, which uh, which surely needs to be uh, confirmed by by larger studies and needs to be understood fully. So, at uh, complete, there are many many things I didn't show, um, and I'll be happy to talk about them. I didn't talk about gas metallicities. Um, I didn't talk about uh, diffuse ionized gas, not about uh, what does the amount of stars formed in the tails depend upon and so on and so forth. So there are so many things, but I'll be happy to uh, be with you and discuss them if you have questions on, about anything. So I'll stop here. Okay, thanks. That was a, a very nice talk. Um, I'm sure there are many questions. So let's start with uh, Gilberto. Uh, 
he's muted. I would like to raise my hand, but I can't in the computer. Can you put me in the line? I'm Rosa. Um, yes, sure. Actually, uh, Gilberto, I think you, you are muted. Um, uh, uh, okay. My connection flickered and I, I didn't hear you gave me the word. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Bianca. It was, it was a wonderful talk. I have a lot of notes that I hope we can discuss later. Um, in your slide where you compare uh, the kinematics, the gas and stellar kinematics, I guess you were showing the first momentum. And uh, do you do you see individual components in the strip gas? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, in some cases, we clearly see a double component because we see in projection two gas moving at different velocities. Uh, not always. You know, sometimes we only see one component in the gas in a, diff, in a, in a given location. But sometimes for projection effects, now I can show I have my disk. So like the one that we see a John here, we do see the double components along this line of sight simply because it rotates and we observe the double component. Yes. Well, I, I was thinking in the ones that are slightly inclined that, so you can see the gas at different stages of being stripped from the disk. Uh, at different stages of being stripped. What dominates here is really the rotation of the disc that is maintained in the strip tail. So most right. of the velocity of the gas in the tail is due to the rotation that is conserved. But of course, we also see the velocity, you know, the one due to the stripping, yes. But it's very hard, I mean, it's hard to know the total velocity vector because they're all projection effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so maybe Rosa, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, thank you, Bianca. Very, very nice, very clear talk. Um, I, I have a question about these unusual molecular gas ratios. These are mostly measured in the tails themselves, right? Also in the disk. I mean, oh. you saw that uh, there is, um, I can show you again if you want to. Um, uh, eh, you see here, for example, this is the disc. Mm -hmm. There is still a lot of molecular gas and also in the tails, yes. Yeah, I, I was wondering if it could be explained at least partially by excitation because you have a lot of star formation and um, it is known that also um, starburst galaxies, for example, um, have, you can see a lot of gas and you don't see that much dark matter. So if you, if you have this high star formation and you get the CO excited, then you can detect it a lot, be a lot better than if it were um, just buried inside of the galaxy. You know? So with, with this high star formation, you get, the, get it illuminated, you get it excited, and then you can see it. And it, that would probably explain the fact that you seem to have the same gas, the same amount of gas, but you have a lot of it, much more than in a normal, normal galaxy in the form of H2. And that would also explain why then apparently on contradictorily, you, you seem to have very low star formation rates compared to the to the, the CO gas. compared to, to the to the CO gas yes so you were saying essentially that uh, the star formation makes the CO much more visible let's say yes, put it very right. simply that's exactly mm -hmm. what i'm saying so does it in starburst also happen does does it happen it also in starburst in star yeah. starburst it happens well what not exactly, I have heard it not exactly expressed like that. The, 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 what, what I've heard is that you have much less dark matter because it seems that there's a lot things that you wouldn't see. I'm, I'm not talking about this really hmm. huge amount of dark matter that we don't know what it is. I'm talking about the, about the fact that you seem to have to be able to see much more 
normal matter like but uh, like why would the, why would sorry i'm sorry my ignorance but why would the reduced amount of dark matter make the co more visible no no I'm, no i'm not it sure i understand so I, what i'm trying to say I, I, maybe i should i am confusing you what i'm saying is that the star formation also illuminates a lot of molecular gas that would otherwise be invisible okay this i understand yes so this that, is that clear. It, it would be a similar kind of thing mm. okay Thank so, you. And there, are, and there, are other, there are other observations that kind of are, agree with this, like observations, innocent observations in the optical, where you will see more CO or see, um, observe more CO in where you have like less material you through the opacity you know that you have a lot of material mm -hmm. and nevertheless you detect more co where you have less dust so you you would think that where i have more dust i am going to detect more co but often you detect more co where you have less dust because where there's a lot of dust it's self-shielded so i think okay. that what you might be having here is a lot of CO that is not self-shielded from the high star formation. I didn't show the dust map, but we have, of course, the dust maps from the Balmer decrement. And uh, there is significant extinction in the clumps, especially in the clumps in the tails as well. I mean, it's what you expect. The, the extinction is higher in the regions of star formation than in the diffuse gas. And so it's a significant amount of extinctions anyway that we see there. So. I know, but there are little little things in in a way. There are little things around the star formation. It's just a possibility. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you. Okay. I, I see think... Roberto is. Having... Yes. Roberto. Yes. Roberto Trelevich has a question. Yes. Uh, is it my turn then? Thank you, Bianca. Very thank interesting. I wonder that your distribution of uh, stellar masses of the region star formation look very interesting. It looks like uh, the distribution of uh, H2 galaxies we observe on the voids, actually. So that's very interesting. Also, it's interesting uh, how is it possible to form this compact region star formation out of the uh, strip gas? Okay. And you mentioned magnetic fields and uh, the also, you have to have self-gravity there somehow at some stage. Um, that's my, it seems to me very, very interesting. But my question, it, it really is uh, chemical composition. You mentioned uh, you, you, you will not mention chemical composition, but uh, I'm interested in that. How is the chemical composition of this regional star formation compared with the, with the main galaxy? I show you slides on the stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, I do have uh, some. Um... So um, gas metallicities, we have three, three results. I, I'm not sure which one you ask, but if we take the metallicity of the gas at uh, effective radius or, you know, in total metal. So if you take the global a measurement of the global metallicity, the jellyfish galaxies and the stripping galaxies in general, they follow the mass metallicity relation of non-stripped cluster galaxies. Although at the lowest masses, so the low mass jellyfish galaxies, they have metallicities in, in clusters that are higher than in the field. These guys also follow the fundamental metallicity relation. So the, the fact that metallicity anti-correlates with the star formation rate, and there is this uh, plane that you well know. Maybe what you're more interested in is the metallicity of the gas in the tails. So this is uh, the one that we published. Yes. Okay, so this is uh, one example. I'll show you um, the next slide, but this is one example. The disc is here, and here there is a very long 120 kiloparsec tail like this. And the metallicity on the right here, I hope you can read it, is 9.2, 9.1, 9. So the metallicity decreases as you go away from the, from the galaxy itself. So decrease of metallicity. Now we have studied the gradients, the metallicity gradients. 
uh, of everything, of the field, the cluster, stripped and non-stripped, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I don't know which one of these things you were most interested in, in the tails or in the disks or the gradients? I, I was thinking if a, if, a, if a star formation in the tails come from strip gas from the disk of a galaxy, it should have similar metallicity or even higher if it is a, a mix with the intracluster medium that is uh, producing, the, producing the pressure. So if we forget about the intercluster medium, at least the uh, metallicity of the star forming regions in these tails should have similar metallicity to the disk of a galaxy because it comes from the disk of a galaxy. Uh, yes, it's coming from the disk of the galaxy. Uh, there are two effects probably here and currently Franchetto is trying to disentangle between these two. So all the jellyfishes we have are like this. The, the gradient in the tail, the, the metallicity decreases as you go away from the galaxy. There are two effects here that we need to disentangle. One is the fact that, let me stop share so I can show you my fantastic model. Can you see this? Okay, so the gas that is stripped here is the gas that is stripped first. And there is a gradient in the disk already. So this is the most metal rich part. And this, this part here has a lower metallicity to start with. So this gas is stripped first and it will be the one that is more further away in the tail. So you do expect some gradient due to the fact that you strip the gas at the beginning like this. And, and there is a metallistic gradient in the disk. However, there is another effect. That actually, um, these guys, uh, most of them are, are quite massive galaxies. We also have some low mass, but the intercluster medium on average has a lower metallicity than the disk of the galaxy. So it could be that we are seeing some mixing with the intercluster medium that will go in agreement with the magnetic field that result, that the gas in the stripped tail mixes with the intercluster medium and the metallicity decreases. And the more it mixes, so the further away, the more the metallicity goes down. Does it make sense to you or? Let me switch on the microphone. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, that depends on the relative velocities. If, if a run pressure, is perpendicular to the disk, uh, well, it's one thing. If it is uh, in, the, in the plane of the disk, you have a different effect. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, but yeah. Um, the point still is that it has to have basically a one-to-one -one relation. If it is, you have run pressure perpendicular to the disk with the position of the disk. That is, your, your magnetic field strip have to have similar metallicity and similar metallicity to the origin and, and not a gradient really. And, yeah, uh, I agree. So that's I why it's very interesting. Yes, that's why I think that what Andrea is concluding is that the mixing with the intercluster medium is more important than the original gradient in the disk. Hmm. Because okay. the simulations, they show, because we, we asked the simulators in the group, how much does it mix? Uh, I mean, how much of the uh, gas that is stripped mix with the other gas that is stripped in the tail? And it, not very much, not very much. So you shouldn't mix the original metallicity. Yeah, but I agree. This is one of the most interesting things we are working on. Now. And also, also it should be, you should find difference between the, if you're right, there should be difference in the composition between the diffuse uh, tail and the compact regions of star formation. Because of self enrichment. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> because of the run pressure effect, basically, and mixing. You mm -hmm. say the diffuse should be more mixed than the than the compact than the dense uh, right. regions. Yeah. <sighs> Unfortunately, if I show you, I mean, I don't have a plot in the in the PowerPoint, but the the metallicity gradient that Andrea finds is quite similar for the diffuse emission for the clumps, which mm. is not what I expected. So there is mm. some puzzle there that we didn't understand yet. But uh, I agree. Thank you. Very it's very you. interesting. Um, okay, so uh, we have time for a 
Uh, one or two more questions. Uh, Ulises Reyes. Hello. Hello, Bianca. Hey, Tom Holland. Uh, uh, you look like Tom Holland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I, I am a student, master student of Jacopo. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, okay, my, my question is, I understood that in general, uh, ram pressure takes the material out from the galaxies, but I didn't understand how is the connection of this phenomenon with, with AGN, because the supermassive black hole needs material to become active. Absolutely. It's counterintuitive. I mean, one would expect if I take the gas out, there will be less gas for the AGN. I, I fully agree. What might be happening, and note that I'm still very cautious about this, but if this correlation is there, what might be happening is that the gas that is still in the disk, not the one that is stripped, the one that is stripped is already stripped, but when there is still a lot of gas in the disk, some of these gas might lose angular momentum and more easily be funneled toward the central region. So the removal of all the gas should happen after the DHGN has been um, uh, triggered. In fact, we see the AGN only in a phase where the tail is still very long, which means that there is still a lot of gas even in the disk. While in the, mm -hmm. in the truncated disks where the gas is already less, um, it's hard, we, we don't see the, that many. So okay. yeah. It should happen you. simultaneously. You, you strip the tail and you trigger the AGN. Okay, thank you very much. So, so actually, so I, I think your explanation makes perfect sense to me, but is there a way to test this uh, observationally, this, this hypothesis of, of the angular momentum? Uh, the... So we are trying several ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one is the simulations that I mentioned. Also, we had the radio observations, H1 observations, and the H1 is in absorption in some of these guys due to the AGN, in absorption. And if we had enough spatial resolution, we could be seeing the gas falling into, falling in. At, at the resolution we have for now from the JDLA and the Meerkat data, and it's not sufficient to see this effect. But so the idea is if we had the A array or something, we had you know, higher resolution, um, we could go to look at what happens in the gas in the central region, at the neutral gas in this case, to increase the resolution. Uh, we also tried X-shooter data, I didn't mention, we got X-shooter data uh, sleet, you know, and try, but but also that probably the, the resolution is not sufficient to see to see it happen. Right, so, right, right. Yeah. To go yeah, closer so, to the center. Yeah. You, you, mean, you mean the shape? You would look for the shape of the H1 line? Yes. Okay. There is a, a, the paper I mentioned, Deb et al., Deb Ferrai and, and et al., where it's one of the, our jellyfishes that has H1 in absorption. We have another one not published yet, where the central H1 is in absorption. And there is a shape of the, of the absorption that might be due to inflow of gas. Might be, but it's degenerate in some ways at this resolution. There is Daniel Victor. I see some hands over there. Yes, there are, there are still some 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 things. Okay, let's let's. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, I quickly mentioned that this angular momentum stuff relates a bit to what I'm currently doing with the illustrious TNG. Although I'm looking for now, I'm just looking mostly at the stars, at the stellar angular momentum rather than the gas. But um, I don't want to make my paper too complicated, right? But um, anyway, <laughs> I, I, I found it fascinating. You know, this 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 result, this result. So okay, let's let's try to quickly, uh, Victor. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, my, my question will oh. be so. so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bianca, for your question uh, for your talk. It was very interesting and clear. Uh, I want I just want to ask at the beginning of your talk, you you say you, your motivation, the motivation of uh, of this work of GASP, I mean, uh, was uh, understand the galaxy the galaxies in closed boxes you mean 
with this in uh, uh, wavelength, uh, limit of wavelength. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I was not clear at the beginning. What I meant is that galaxies are not closed boxes. So galaxies do not evolve like in a box, but they can exchange gas with the outside. They can accrete gas, they can lose gas. So they are not closed boxes, they are open boxes. Okay. That's what I meant. Okay, okay. I, I, so there is a lot of interaction with the environment, but also due to feedback, you know, the internal yeah. processes, external processes that can affect what's happening in the galaxy. Uh, intercluster? Uh, with the intercluster medium, but in general, you know, with other nearby galaxies and so on. And I should mention, I only talked about ramp pressure stripping today. There was already so much to say, and, and I didn't, I said only a little part. But there is, if you want to know about the other processes, you should invite Benedetta Vulcani, who is the one that studied the, the groups and the filaments where we observe all the other processes. So, we, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Hey, thanks. And finally, let's go with Ma Mauricio, who has his hand. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, do you expect or have you observed in your MUSE observations uh, high mass star formation, like as young as four mega years in the tails of the of the jellyfish galaxies? I'm thinking in the helium-24686 uh, broth nebular or diffuse with the MUSE uh, data cups. So you are asking if we saw these lines, especially? Um, yes. Like we saw, good. yes, the answer is yes. In some cases, we did. And uh, of course, we cannot observe the single stars, we don't have resolve. But um, the interesting thing, and I didn't mention this, that we, when we compare the star formation rates from H alpha, that's corrected for Barmer decrement, with that from the UV, we have far UV, near UV for a number of these guys. They give pretty consistent star formation rates, which seems to suggest that the IMF cannot be that, that far off. You know, in, as you know, these star formation indicators are all based on the massive stars. You know, they, they are the massive stars that dominate the star formation rate indicators, but they have different time scales and different ranges of stars. And yet the star formation rates we derive from UV and H alpha are surprisingly in agreement. I would never respect that because I thought, well, the IMF would go be all over the place. As you like. But uh, everything behaves like if there are uh, massive stars, sometimes we see the lines um, uh, directly, but like if there are messy stars in the normal proportion that you would expect, which was quite amazing to me. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we should thank uh, Bianca uh, again for a uh, yeah, very inter interesting talk. Thanks to um, you. It has been a pleasure to be with you tonight. <laughs> Yeah, and, and oh, thanks yeah. to Jacopo for inviting her. So, um, okay, so good, goodbye. Uh, see you next week. Hope to see you all uh, in reality soon. Yes, bye bye. Yes, bye, -bye. Ciao, Bianca. Bye. 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 Ciao, ciao.